morning and you're welcome to The Key Points. My name is Jifa Bampo. It's great to have the privilege of your company today, Saturday. And thank you very much for joining us. So it's my pleasure to bring you up to speed about all the major issues that came up this week. And on the bill today, Agenda 111, Government Health Infrastructure Agenda in Perspective. Also, the Akufuado administration's anti-corruption fight. Is it a myth or a reality? We are live on TV3 and 3FM 92.7, as well as around the world at 3news.com. Join us via our Facebook page as well. It's TV3 underscore Ghana. Between now and uh, 9.50, we'll be able to hear from you. So share your messages via our WhatsApp line 055-369-8789. You can also tweet at TV3 underscore Ghana at 3FM 92.7, also at me. Beho Bampo. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome back to the key points on TV3 and 3FM, as well as 3news.com. You can send your messages to our WhatsApp line 055-369-8789. Our hashtag is hashtag the key points. Now this week, the president broke ground for an ambitious healthcare uh, infrastructure drive. And this is the commencement of the uh, ambitious Agenda 111 project, which will provide healthcare access to Ghanaians. It uh, provides for some 101 district hospitals, seven uh, regional hospitals, including the rehabilitation of that in the Western region, as well as um, three psychiatric hospitals. So in terms of whether this is possible or not, just to take you back, it was not too long ago, I think in 2020, when the president announced that they will be building 88 district hospitals. That didn't happen. Now we have uh, some 101 uh, hospitals which will be built within, guess what, 12 to 18 months. Is that a realistic timeline to deliver these hospitals, knowing that the Eurojet projects have taken well over eight years and still counting? My guests uh, this morning are Mr. Eduji Tamaklu. He is an NDC legal team member. We will also have in studio the GMA uh, General Secretary, Dr. Justice Youngson, as well as the NPP's Deputy Communications uh, Director, uh, Mr. Kamal Dean Abdullahi. We'll also have the National President of the Coalition of NGOs in Health. All of that coming up this morning. But thank you very much, Mr. Tameklu, for joining us in studio. How are you? Good morning, Jifa, and uh, good morning to your cherished viewers. Uh, All I'm right. Okay, this morning. Great. Yeah. So, government has uh, rolled out this infrastructure agenda. I saw a post put up by Dr. Baumia trying to uh, poke at the NDC, saying that the NDC is the party of the impossible that everything cannot happen. Uh, government is determined to roll out and implement this uh, agenda. In terms of the objective, 12 to 18 months, should we not wait and see if this will be delivered? Um, Jifa, ordinarily, um, I should not be responding to the jocular comments from the vice president relative to these serious matters of health infrastructure. Look, you see, let's elevate. When you occupy a position like the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, you need to elevate the conversation from the, the, the usual sloganeering that, oh, for NDC, is a question of impossibility. What we are looking at is the question of credibility in delivering health infrastructure. Now our point is this. If you pick the 2016 MPP manifesto, which became the social contract between the MPP and the good people of this country, under health, they had indicated 
that with the benefit of power, they were going to build health infrastructure, that is hospitals, in districts without hospitals. Mm -hmm. That is what brought about the 88. So when that promise was made, 2017 budget, no mention of it. 2018, no mention. 2019, no mention. 2020, COVID came. Then on 25th of April 2020, if you recall, in one of the president's you know, addresses to the nation during the lockdown, it was then that the president indicated that they were going to build 88 hospitals. Of that, they will build two psychiatric hospitals, among other regional hospitals in the new regions. That was when the conversation started. Then we indicated that, look, in your 2016 manifesto, you had already indicated that you were going to build hospitals in districts without hospitals. So this is nothing new. In any case, you have even delayed in the takeoff because you are in your fourth year, 2020, without even putting block or mortar on the ground, yet alone to start. So we said, look, Mr. President, it's good you come out with some of these programs, but be realistic with the good people of this country. Because already, the NDC administration has started several of these hospitals. When you came, you decided that you were going to do audits of these projects. And so the projects had already stored for Mina, Bequire, and several other places had stored. So we said, look, instead of starting this, complete what the NDC has started so that we can move on. Before the NDC left, somewhere around November, December, we got Parliament to approve VAMED to construct about 12 polyclinics. Mm -hmm. Focus on delivering those ones that people can use. You do not wait for COVID to come and now come and speak to Ghanaians that, look, I want to do this at this point. That is not visionary leadership. Right. So that was how the co uh, conversation we situated it. Mm -hmm. It is not a question of NDC saying that it is impossible to build. Why? You can promise 111 and deliver 20. So the, the whole conversation ought to be situated very well. Okay. I'll, but, I'll come back to you on that, uh, Mr. Tamaklu, but let's take a quick break and uh, hear what the president has been saying about this. The building of these new healthcare facilities. My vision is to help make Ghana the center of excellence for medical care in West Africa by 2030. This we will achieve by investing more in the development of our healthcare infrastructure, mapping our regional health facilities to specialization, as well as upgrading selected facilities in our regional and teaching hospitals. The president there speaking about Agenda 111. I think the critical thing also to be raised is that uh, these are 100-bed hospitals and they will cost uh, some $16.88 million. And a commencement fee of some $100 million has um, been applied for the start of these hospitals. But ultimately, all these hospitals together will cost more than what, some $1.7 billion. And that's also another extra expenditure to bring in. Let me bring in and welcome Dr. Justice Youngson, who is the uh, General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. Dr. Youngson, thank you very much for joining us on Key Points. Good morning. Jifa, most welcome. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure being on your show. Great. So there's uh, the whole debate about uh, government's delivery of these uh, hospitals. Are these realistic timelines? The president said 18 months to deliver uh, some 101 hospitals. For now, we know 88 are assured because the land and the processes for uh, getting the procurement and all that is up and, and running. Okay. If I, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not too sure if I will need a bit of clarity from you. I think from my understanding, the 18 months starts from the day a particular project starts. Exactly. Of course. If that is it, then I think it's doable. I was part of a private sector group that developed the Ghana Infectious Disease Center in the midst of COVID, 100 bed capacity hospital. We were able to do it under three months. If the country is committed to improving the health of the people, then I think within 18 months, we should be able to deliver on a project 
if we really want to. You are building a hospital for the people. How long would you want to wait? If in terms of structural development, the professionals are saying that you can put up a structure in one and a half years for the people in a certain district that do not have any health facility to serve them, to get access to health, then I think it's doable. The key thing here is the commitment on the part of the state itself. Because many a time, sometimes you see developments happening in terms of construction, and then at some point it's sort of uh, abandoned or you, you, the project halts and you don't know when we are going to go back and they talk about variation and what have you. Elsewhere, when a project is ongoing, the contractors will go to sites. They don't leave the site till the project is over. So I think the key thing here is the commitment. And this is something that we cannot negotiate on. But Reason does government really have the commitment? Because we've had other hospital projects, and Mr. Edwiji Tamaklo referred to the Eurojet hospitals, some of which are still you know, under construction or work is still ongoing, some need equipment and all that. He referenced another um, you know, approval to build polyclinics, for instance. We have all these projects dotted all over the place. Why should we be building new ones? Well, in terms of the commitment, unfortunately, I don't speak for government, <laughs> and uh, I cannot answer. But for me as a citizen, I will urge government to ensure that the necessary commitment is actually given to every one of these projects so that we are able to do it. In terms of why we should do it, or why 88, I'm not so keen about the number per se, but if you look at it, we have well, about 260 districts. So if you have 88 of them without any health facility, obviously there is something wrong. You can't have almost a third of your population not having access to health facilities when it comes to their basic health care. Mind you, the district hospitals actually sit at the pinnacle of our primary health care delivery. And that is what we will usually be looking at when we are talking about universal health coverage and what have you. And our constitution enjoins the state to ensure that everybody has access to basic health care. For which reason, if you have a third of your districts without the district hospital that we have all agreed that at least every district should have a hospital, then obviously there is a need to do them. I'm not here to justify government's decision or not, but for us as a professional body, our commitment is that, look, we will push any government whatsoever to ensure that the people of Ghana have the right health care delivery at all times. Mm. For us, that is it. It is not about party A, party B, no. It's about the people. We need to have access to basic health care. And that one, I think, no matter what, it is non-negotiable. Sometimes those of us in Accra, we make mistakes, or in the big cities. You may think that, well, once you are here and you have access to some good health facilities, that's fine. But one day, you could find yourself in any of these districts. And uh, for whatever reason, you may need to have some sort of health needs that will have to be attended to. At that point, it may be an emergency, but for whatever it is, if you don't get some quick intervention, that could spell doom for you. So making sure that the people have access to quality health care, I think it's a commitment that the states cannot afford to lose sight of. And whether it's party A, party B, party C, whoever is in power at all times will have to ensure that we have access to good quality health care. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And that's Dr. Justice Youngson. He's the GMA's uh, General Secretary. We have via Zoom Mr. Bright Emisanyako, who is the National President of the Coalition of NGOs in Health. We are also joined now by Mr. Kamal Dean Abdullahi. MPP's uh, Deputy Communications Director. You're welcome, uh, Mr. Abdullah. So I have to launch into you. Why do we have to, you know, invest, what, another 1.7 billion in hospitals when we have many others that are yet to be completed? Polyclinics, hospitals, chips compound, which also need equipment, 
these are funds that probably could have finished all of these and then we can move on well thank you very much and um, i must apologize to viewers for being a bit late um so I underestimated the traffic situation. Um, good morning to you. Good morning to the General Secretary, as well as my good friend, Ebigi Tamaklo. Difa, I'm happy we have a health expert sitting with us here um, who would agree with me that provision of health is the actual wealth that we need in society. And that being said, infrastructure in the health sector is a process one must embark on to be able to achieve it to the fullest. And sometimes even not to the fullest, but at least to a level where we shall all appreciate or we all appreciate. Diva, you ask a simple question. Why do we have ongoing projects? And instead of making sure that we have all these projects completed, commissioned, and of course, put in use before thinking of new ones, okay? We're not doing that, but rather we're adding to the existing ongoing projects, new projects that we're going to start to build. Difa, I have always said that provision of infrastructure is a going concern, especially in a developing nation as we have. One cannot say that we are adequate when it comes to staffing in the health sector. One equally cannot also say that we are adequate when it comes to infrastructure in the health sector or provisioning the health sector. Since the inception of the fourth Republican constitution, let me take it from there. Of course, we could even go beyond that one because history, but let's take it from the inception of the fourth Republican constitution. There has been attempts by, by governments upon governments, okay, or governments after governments to ensure that the needs of the people are met in terms of the provision of infrastructure. That has brought us this far. I don't know, I, maybe my colleague... Um, well, I'm not exactly on, sure you're answering my I, question. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. Maybe my colleague on the other divide had mentioned maybe the Eurojet project, And then for instance. Uh, one other... Very uh, well. the These are some project. of the... I am aware that we came to meet some handing over notes, okay, after we won 2016. 2017 was sworn in, handing over notes were given to us. The health sector, we had inherited series of projects that were ongoing. Some never even started at all, but yet funding was actually sought for them and gotten. Question is, where are we with such projects today? There are those who are out there saying that we are launching Agenda 111, when in fact the projects we have even inherited within the health sector, okay, are not completed. But that's not a lie. Trust me, that's not true. No, but that's not a lie. The, Very are, economical yeah. with the truth. I am going to give you the statistics. It's simple. It's here. On the Eurojet, for instance, we're talking of Trifu Prasso, for instance, which is part of the project. It is commissioned as we speak now, since last November. We're talking about um, Nsoko, completed and commissioned since last November 2020. We're talking about um, Tepa completed and commissioned since last November 2020. That is under the Eurojet project. You see, once so when I say people come to serve us with some half truth or half, I don't know, being economical with the truth to us, of course we would understand. Okay, but, That's we, are I'm told, saying. but we are told that there is also a hospital in Tredia, the very place that uh, the commissioning happened and that hospital has not also been completed. I, I have not said that entirely we have done uh -huh. everything. So my, my, I think is the that, conversation and, and I, is about those yes. that are incomplete. So Difa, the point is that if you have one hospital or a particular hospital in a particular jurisdiction that is not completed, it gags you or stops you from initiating a monumental project like this that would come to help our society, does it stop you? It should not stop you, but the question, but the question is that why not con continue what is still no, hanging? Ziva. I'm not saying infrastructure is not important, but if monies have been borrowed for these projects, let's complete Ziva, the, I'm not, the I'm process. Not sure, I'm not sure there's a communication out there that these projects, we have a hindrance and that we cannot complete them. No, what I'm saying is that it is a going concern. Some have been completed. We are on the course of making sure that series of these projects are completed. I think there's Look, also another I, hospital at uh, Afari. 
That too. Yeah, you can mention two or three. Some yes. of uh, they are ongoing. They are at various stages of completion. But you see, the government of the day sat down to say, look, we have had all these projects. But how many districts do we have in this country? Okay, so this is about, Relevance the, dist of the, so matter. This is about the districts that don't have hospitals. Very well. Relevance of the matter is that we've had this. If Tepa has, other districts don't have. So the, for instance, maybe there has been some clinic that is in the orphan. Government says, no, let's upgrade it to a status of a hospital or a district hospital. Let us be able to do that. Then government looks into the, if you like, into matters that are going on in the health sector and say that, look, all these 250 something districts that we have in this country, over 88, running to about 111, do not have hospitals. Is it critical and essential for us to provide such facilities? Then someone says, no, the argument is that we've not even completed some of them. Why are we having this? I think with a greater respect, we are a developing country. We need some of these critical, if you like, um, uh, uh, amenities. Okay, you know, so for you, so for government, the focus is on the areas that don't have hospitals, irrespective of the other projects that are. That is complete. exactly what we're okay. doing. And, and, I've, and I, I want us to give credit to the government of the day that, look, anyone who sits somewhere to say that, look, and I can go on and on and on, there's a plethora of projects that okay, we have so completed you, you, and we can do okay, them. Okay, so I'll, but I'm saying I'll hold your horse. You yes, hold your right horses. Right. I think the, the fundamental point has been made. Okay. And I, I know that Edgy will take you up on that. But let me go to um, the president of the uh, coalitions in health, Mr. Bright Emisa. Good morning, sir, and thank you for joining us on uh, Key Points. For you, what's the outlook? Do you see us, um, you know, completing these in good time to serve the communities that are underserved? Thank you very much, Jifa. Good morning. Good morning to the panelists and uh, good morning to your, your viewers. I think I, we, we are having a very good uh, conversation this morning, and I like the way it's going so far. The whole issue is about the infrastructure gap at the primary health care level. Here we are talking about the, the district um, level largely. And if um, the, the, the government wants to bridge the gap at that level, we are all for it. The coalition of NGOs in health has always said um, um, this, that um, primary health care has not been fully accessible um, in the country. So when the president in his first tenure of office even came, and then we saw this in the, uh, in the manifesto, and for that matter, he made a, a, a strong pronouncement about it in the, in the second tenure. Then we were so happy, we applauded him. And they will continue to applaud him for even um, recognizing this and then coming out boldly to get these um, um, gaps uh, bridged. However, our concern has been one, the commitment and then the cost of, of, the, of the project. So the, the timelines of 18 months, just like we are all discussing and looking at, if you start any project now, you break the ground and then you start laying blocks, you give yourself um, a month or two, three, and then the funding is available, then it becomes achievable. But what do we see now? What we see now is there is some seed money, let's say about 600 million Ghana cities. That is going to take care of the whole 88 for now. Like you see, I mean, they've done um, a lot of feasibility studies on the 88 and um, remaining about 23, which has um, land issues and so on and forth. So we're still even talking about the 88. Uh, are we able to ascertain that the seed money could do this to its final completion uh, at the end of the 18-month period? And if you make projections into the future, looking at when this tenure of office of the president is, is going to end, and then you make physical projections into it, then you don't get so convinced that it is achievable within the period that um, it is given. Okay, so, so Mr. Emisa, I, I think that's one point you make. The other point I want to bring to your attention is in the president's speech, he indicated that this is an opportunity to employ, uh, what, some more than 20,000 healthcare professionals. As of last year in 2020, we know that some 20,000 nurses are yet to get on government payroll. And with the doctors, I dare say it's about 1,000 because we have some 450 foreign doctors who had complained of not getting into the public service. And so I'm sure there are, there are others. I'm just wondering, with that kind of background, 
these hospitals, will we really uh, pick up our healthcare professionals? Yes, um, building about 111 ho hospitals is a huge project that could bridge the, the, the uh, employment gap as well in the health sector. That I perfectly agree that a huge number of um, um, people are going to be employed. That is why we've always um, applaud him for this um, uh, um, pronouncement. But are we going to see it in reality within this, his tenure? Our discussion should be focused on that. We are not saying it is not feasible, it is not achievable. Everybody will be able to achieve it when the, the financial commitments are there. So a lot of these health workers are there. They need work to do. People need to work. We agree. But in what record time is it going to, 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 to come into, into frustration? When do we see this happening? Are we counting like the, the first one that he, he, he break grounds for? Are we looking at it as getting to completion in 18 months from uh, last Tuesday to the next 18 months? No, it's from the, yes. it's from the day a project begins. Exactly, exactly, my sister. So let's, let's look at the amount that is available now. So if you look at the amount that is available now, then you could agree with me that from the day the project begins, like the first one the president um, cut short for, should be completed in the next 18 months. That means one out of the 600 million Ghana cities given can be completed as such. But I hear the discussion to be, it is a, it is a money to be given uh, to the contractors for mobilization for all 88. So if the project is going to take that cue and that angle of giving mobilization, and then they wait, the contractors look for funding and on those things, our fear is that by the end of the president's tenure, they might have raised a lot of structures to a certain um, um, percentages that are not completed and might have not done us a lot of good. All so right. if they look at putting them in phases and then getting them completed in, in those phases, that one becomes more realistic than getting them open and say 18 months. One, yes, of course, it could even be completed before 18 months when the project starts and there's money. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Emisa. You can hold on there because uh, we'll get some thoughts from Dr. Youngson, particularly on the employment of healthcare professionals, because that's uh, a major issue. But Mr. Tamaklo, I know that you want to raise some issues, particularly on the funding. So go ahead. Yes, Jifa. Uh, it's important that, again, and, and I'm happy that um, the president of the coalition of coalition NGOs in health had brought a very interesting perspective to the conversation, which has to do with funding. As we speak, we have been told that an amount of 100 million from the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund has been earmarked for the start of this project. So that if you have 88 projects against $100 million, we are effectively talking about a million dollar or so for each of these 88 projects for the takeoff, correct? Yes. It's more than 88. Yes. But no, no, no. For now, now it's 88 now because, because that's where they, that's where they, where they have land. land. Essentially, yeah. 87. Good, 87. Okay, 87. Now, if you pick this 87 against $100 million, then we are dealing effectively with one point something, one point something million for each. <laughs> now, we are told that the cost of one is $16.8 million, $12 million for the fiscal infrastructure, and $4 million for the equipment and tooling. So if at the project completion, uh, uh, the start, you are just getting only one million, and when the question is put to government officials, that the remaining, because if you are doing 88 times 16, we are looking at a little over one billion dollars. If you are only giving 10% of the money for commencement, question is, the remaining amount, how are we going to fund it? Now, when you ask government officials, their response is that it is going to be three budget cycles. Now, three budget cycle is 12, 12, 12. And so that already takes us beyond 18 months. <laughs> that already, per, three budget cycle <laughs> that's effectively means that we are way beyond the, you know. Now, if we are taking 100 million, okay, from the Ghana Infrastructure Fund, 
and you are going to do this in 18 months. Remember that the proceeds into the Ghana Infrastructure Fund are principally from, you know, petrol. 20 pesos from petrol when you purchase. 2.5% VAT, among other things. That is the, the, the process into the Ghana Infrastructure Fund. So if that is going to be the principal source of funding, already there is going to be a credibility challenge relative to funding. The reason why I make this point is that under the NDC administration, when we decided to roll out this health infrastructure, and knowing the challenges that come with funding, we decided that, look, we're going to do borrowed funds to complete this project. Because we learn from experience, the Eurojet projects. When Eurojet, Kufor brought them, they were supposed to bring money to complete the project from Egypt. Then 2011, if you recall, the Arab Spring in Egypt stalled the funding for those projects. So it has to take the Muhammad administration to get backless into the conversation. That is how we were able to even complete the war and other projects because then we got Barclays providing funding for it. It took eight years to get that funding arrangement completed. So we have the benefit of experience. And we are saying that, look, you cannot roll out such massive infrastructure projects when you do not even have dedicated funding. I'll give you a classic example. In fact, do you know that if you give this kind of project without dedicated funding, when the contractors even go and get money to do this project, at the end of the day, the interest on delay payments alone will take the project cost out of everything. So it is not a question of you can do it or you cannot do it. Okay, so People are simply asking you that if you are even saying that the 100 million, I am doing five at a go within 18 months, 100 million dollars for five projects completed and delivered, people can see. And that is why the, the president indicated that you roll out certain in phases so that you are saying that first 20, this is the seed capital. Another set of 20, this is the seed capital. Then people can go along with you. Mm. In any case, just by aside, why? Even the president's own priority or priority projects, the National Cathedral, where has he got into? Okay. Okay. On a lighter note. I think, I think that's, on a lighter that's, that's a, I'm happy that's he's a, added the last one. Red herring. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Red okay, herring. So, 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 but um, I think the point EDG makes is critical. No point. About, about fine. No, no not about point. the cathedral. I know about the funding. Uh, about the funding. I'm saying it's not a point at all. So do, we have, do we have the money? Because it's interesting he points out, and I remember Kojo Oponkrumah, the information minister, told yes. me that on my radio show that three budget cycles. Mm -hmm. So that means you are delivering all the 88 at the end of term of the president. Respectfully, um, with recourse to the Financial Management Act, he's a lawyer. This talk about mobilization does not even appear at all. It's not banned by law up to speak today. I know that no, this I, time, I, it's almost I, I, as I am if, making a point. No, if but I, it's almost if as I, you if, allowed him to yes, flow, just no, allow I'm me just to make a point. That it almost I, I, seem, I, seems that the nomenclature has changed. Now they say commencement funding. I am saying, I am saying that, I've just, I just want to set a premise. Okay. And I'm saying that the doubting Thomases, okay, which my good brother, Eddie Tomoklo belongs to, okay, are not sure of where we are going to get the funds. And it's not the first time we are there. You remember when our major and flagship program, which is the free SHS, was actually proposed before even we came to power. They, even in government, said, where are we going to get the money? I don't it's, think that's but, true, sir, because the president don't. was on hard talk, and that question was asked him where it would be funded. He could not he answer. answer. Yes, Diffa, please. Diffa, Diffa, so please, let's Diffa, not blame even, it on the even, NDC. Diffa, 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 yeah. Diffa, respectfully, I'm saying that <laughs> even they, the NDC, when we would propose free SHS in opposition, knowing very well that we're going to think out of the box, put modalities in place in the eyes of the law to raise the money and make sure Ghanaian child gets education if he's supposed to or she's supposed to. They actually came out to say we could not do it. Now when we got power, our first budget inculcated therein had to do with expenditure towards free SHS. They said, oh, this will not see the light of day. Trust me, this will not travel far. 
to the extent that their own flag bearer, even after we had implemented, went to Cape Coast and said, look at the budgetary allocation alone for free education. was too much. Other sectors of education will suffer. Today, as we speak, free education, they want to claim credit. Same applicable to what we have today. I am saying that this ambitious project, this great project demands great thinking. Demands sitting in the room and preparing properly, thinking out of the box and see how we can go, we're going to fund this. Can you tell and us about doubt, the funding yes, strategy? Yes, I've just told you that, yes, he has made reference to the amount of money we put in the budget the last time, which we're moving to give. And through GIF, we shall be paying some 10%, 10% each to the, the, the Ghana Infrastructure Fund, which was set I'm up by the previous administration, which what? I remember you why? criticized. Why? 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 Having they criticized, even free SHS, even as we speak, they're okay. taking credit. All right, fine. So you tell us about They are taking the credit. Okay, so, so you so tell us what is about wrong their funding. They have, they, have always, they have always said that governance is a continuum. <laughs> so if you come out with an idea and you didn't even put a seed, cap, a, a, a password in it, and we have come to put money in it and then making sure that it's going to go through an infrastructure development for all of us, wouldn't to be a good one. Okay, so you tell me about so the, the funding point I want to be, The funding now is that I'm saying what the law says we should not have done. We have been able to say that no. Aside that, GIF can step in. Some amount of money being about $100 million, like he rightly said, is in there. Let's give some commencement support to the contractors mm -hmm. to urge them on. But if, I, if you look at or you know how it operates in the construction sector, contractors after taking the contract are supposed to pre-finance the project, get to a level where they will raise a certificate, take it back, and then of course, at that point, some amount of money will pay them, then they continue if they have to. And there are even some contractors who would take the contract and embark on the project, execute it to the end, before even raise those who have the, capa I mean, the, the capacity. So the point is that if you say it's a three budget cycle, I agree. But see, this has to do with payment procedure. Why? Haven't you had contractors who have completed projects and come to tell that we have finished the project, we are not going to hand it over to government because we have not been paid. We've had that in the past. We've had that even still. <laughs> so it tells you. you still owe contractors no? No, I am saying five point no something government. billion. Tell me CDs. a government that has come and never so owed contractors. I think, so Mr. Kamal, I'm saying, not no. to be fair, no, to be fair, yes. I think the point we are all just mm -hmm. trying to get you yes. to get us yes. to is how will these projects be funded without the calamity of contractors going on the streets and mm -hmm. demonstrating or losing their property because they can't pay the debt? I mean, I think that's the concern. So why not, a, the, why not give us what the... Are we delivering I, I, the projects in phases, for what, instance? What I, can say, what I can say for sure is that the government is fully committed to ensuring that these projects are executed and completed. In the same vein, the government is committed to ensuring that we think out of the box, ensure that, of course, by next year, wherever we're going to work hard to get the money legitimately to fund these projects, is going to happen. Okay, I, a lot need, of thinking, I need to bring A lot of thinking will, has gone into it. A lot of arrangements has gone into it. And I can tell you that once it's a GOG project and we are so ambitious and so ready to execute them, same where are we going to fight hard to ensure that the money comes in? You see, this talk okay, about... I'll, I'll come back no, to you to on end, that end, because end, Let me just end. This talk about... This, this talk, wait a minute. This talk about we cannot do it. We cannot do it. Nobody like I said, we've seen it before. <laughs> we've seen... People have said, oh, we can't yeah. get the money. We've seen it before okay. and we have executed it. Same way are we going to ensure that the Agenda 111 is going to be completed and commissioned here in this country, okay. given the time that we have. Yes, been. Dr. Janssen, come in. So while Dr. Janssen is speaking, you can reflect yeah. upon the 600 million, which is already in the budget, yeah. some 36 million already paid to the architects and designers. Don't worry, that's Yes, um, <laughs> Dr. Janssen. If I, I think that two things have been discussed here, and one of them is very clear, unless maybe Eddie has some other view. What is very clear across board is that the Agenda 111 for the health needs of the people is a welcome activity. I think there's no doubt about it. It's a good one. The key problem now that, unfortunately, I think government and to an extent Kamal has not really been able to convince all of us is the funding or the financing of the projects. And uh, I think that it's in government's own interest to, as soon as possible, 
put whatever strategies they have out there for all of us to, in quote, be fully convinced that the funding ultimately will be available. I think that is the basic problem we seem to be grappling with at this point. Mm. But I think we also need to put a few things in context. Let's not get hooked into this, in quote, 87, 88, 87, 88, because we are talking about one, one, one. And per my understanding, this is supposed to happen within the next three years. So if we take the 88 or 87 out, we still have a certain 23. Mm -hmm. That 23 includes 13 district hospitals, seven, seven regional, regional hospitals, and three Three's mental health, health facilities. Yeah. Obviously, that 10, the regional hospital and the mental health facilities, most likely will cost more. Because the regional hospitals are supposed to be the secondary level care mm -hmm. activities. Mm -hmm. Their requirements in terms of equipment and the sizes and what have you may be way bigger than a district hospital. Certainly. So there is still some funding beyond the 1.7 billion that we are all talking about that we need to get. Mm -hmm. And we think that these are some of the things that government will have to work on quickly and make sure that there is clarity for all of us. Would the GMA like to at least see a certain plan that demonstrates how this is done? Because, I mean, now there's a certain un unsureness about whether, and I know you said we shouldn't dwell on the 88 or 87, but at no, least... No, I'm not saying we shouldn't dwell on no, what I mean is, is that. So let's not focus solely on that. On let's that, remember that there's that also there a certain 23. Hospitals. Yeah, but what I think I would like to know is, so in 2022, how many hospitals will be complete? It's will only it government that can tell us. But mm -hmm. per my understanding of what has happened now, this 600 million is money that were captured in last year's budget mm -hmm. that have actually been allocated and disbursed into the infrastructure fund. This was from last year. Unfortunately, I don't know what disbursement or what provision we've made for these projects from this current budget. And maybe Kamal may have to tell us. No, so, no, just, let me just yes, in 30 seconds. You see, if you look at the mid-year budget that was presented yeah. a few uh, weeks ago or days ago, sure. you notice that at Appendix 4D, in Appendix 4D, government provided the expenditure for the 2020 COVID funds. And in that 2020 COVID utilization and allocation, they had indicated that 600 million has already been utilized. No, no. But that's the challenge uh, I, 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 I have no, with no. that data. I, 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 no, I, 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 I've been on a couple no, of programs where this has been discussed. Mm. Yesterday, John Kuma, Dr. John Kuma, yeah. who is the Deputy Finance Minister, also shared a little more light. Mm. Basically, all they sought to say was that in 2020, we made provision of 600, yeah. which has been pushed into the infrastructure fund. Of course, I'm sure it's been invested as well. Out of that, the pre-contract activities that have happened so far is 36 million. Absolutely. I don't know whether all of it has been paid or not, not, but definitely some expenditure. That's the phase part. one of the project. No, uh, come on. No, you see, you come, see no, 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 uh, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> no, doctor, I think no, you see, no, I think, I think, I think, you see, mm -hmm. I think we should just understand what has happened mm -hmm. so that we can also critique an egg government to do the best for all of us. Absolutely. I think for me, that's uh, very no, fair. Okay, so let's, so let's the key thing is that, the key thing is that <laughs> beyond what you did last year mm -hmm. by allocating 600 and starting the pre-contract activities, which for me is good because every project, you need to do these things. Let there be clarity on the funding in terms of what probably GOG itself will provide this year as well and the subsequent years. And then if, let's say, the private sector or individual contractors are going to fund certain things in total or partially or whatever. Let all of it be clear to us. That way, I think everybody will be very confident. But once these things are left hanging, then people begin to you know, come out thinking that, well, it's the usual talk and all that. And for me, that will be a disservice to the people of Ghana if we should end up that way. Because for the 101 project, we actually need them to close or bridge that gap that we have all envisaged. Because you can't have a situation where more than a third of your, or less about a third of your districts in Ghana don't have access 
to primary health care because the district hospital actually sits at the top of the primary health care activity. It is key. So I think that it's a good ambition. It's a good agenda that government has set itself to. But the questions that are coming up, government should do its best to explain them as soon as possible for us. Okay, let me ask Mr. Emisa if he wants to weigh in on, I know you kicked off the financial discussion, but for instance, do you know how many hospitals may be completed next year, for instance? So, Jifa, if we are looking at it from, from that angle, and then and let me come back to what Kamal said, and then quote his own words. If we are not careful, you notice that we are going to over-rely on the, the, the commitment of contractors with the assumption that they are going to look for funding to complete the, the project. Now, these contractors can get the project completed without handing them over, and it doesn't make the facility functional. So our fears and challenges have been that government show commitment. Let us see where the amount or the, the cutting of the project is coming from so that we know that the ownership is, is, is from government. In any case, if even you go around to, to, to tell us that you are going to borrow money, put it into it, and then the facility runs whilst it's paid for it, we'll be happy. But to leave it with contractors who for now has not even been able to demonstrate they will be able to kickstart the project without the commencement plan from government becomes very challenging. For us, we, if we study the, the terrain and then how the challenges with the country now amidst COVID, we are of the view that for the tenure of this particular government to complete, they will not be able to complete more than 20 functional for us out of the 101. And these are the things that we want government to tell us so that the people get so committed and follow it. With the assumption that, you see, this stage or this phase, we are able to do this. In the next phase, we are able to do this. Then we encourage other governments to look up to this and then also get the rest completed for us. But we don't want to see a situation where you start all of them at a goal and they are all hanging. And then we go back to the same story that every project has a different funding source. We don't want to be hearing this uh, moving forward. So we are, we are only proposing that government shows us where the funding is coming from. We all look at it. Even in this, um, um, this year's budget, we are yet to know whether we are going to see an allocation for this project. And is it going to be bigger than 600 million? And where is that money also coming from? Then we look at the next budget cycle. So what we are even talking about now is from the previous budget. And then this year, we have not seen it. We are looking at next year before the president exits. So the issues are very dicey um, to talk about, but we need to speak to it that do what you think your strength can do now. The people would appreciate it and praise you for it. Other governments take over from you and they also look at it and then get uh, uh, the rest completed. Thank but you. don't do any work that will leave all 111 hanging. That is what we don't want to see. So for us, our projections are that they will be able to do. 20 by the end of tenure of um, um, Nanado. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Emisa. Well, yes, Kamal, he's over to you. He's projected that we'll be able to do 20 by the end of um, Nanado's tenure. And I want to assure you again that just as we've been able to embark on projects that people doubted we could not do, so are we going to ensure that this ambitious and all important projects are going to be completed so, as well. So again, the funding issue, do you know how much is budgeted for 2021? No, you see, Jifa, we are yet to have the budget for 2020. I mean, for No, I mean for the hospital. No, 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 of course. I, obviously, we've mentioned that. Um, it's 600 EDG, from EDG, yeah, 600, 600. Yeah, 600. Yes, that's what I mean. That is what we did. And that is what we are pushing into GIF for the commencement okay, so of this project. So there is but no there, addition for 2021? No, no addition Jifa, yet, as we Jifa, say. Jifa, no addition uh, yet, as uh, we uh, say. Uh, and I'll add you just yeah. 30 seconds. You mm -hmm. see, Jifa, let's situate this conversation well mm -hmm. so that we carry our viewers through. We have been told that the 600 million is actually a 2020 yes. COVID allocation. Mm -hmm. And that even though it is captured as utilized, the utilization is actually the movement of the funds to the Ghana infrastructure investment, and that it has not been utilized in quotes, mm -hmm. and that it is safe in an account. Can I therefore say that for the 2021 budget, there was no allocation 
for agenda. And I think one that's one. the point we are trying to make. And that is where but people, says, is he, is he where people say that. You are repeating, no. you are but repeating, you are repeating what you just said. He says, he says no allocation has been done we, for 2021 absolutely. as yet. So it means when the minority, the media diva, 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 come already. Diva, when the minority held the press conference, they raised this matter. The finance ministry came out with a response and explained to us, okay, the allocation of this 600 million, okay, and what is actually meant for. I think that's clear that, now. That's clear. So the point is, going forward. So for 2021, we, we, we is there a potential we, allocation? No. There, obviously, we, yes, yes, there, there is a potential obviously. allocation. I don't think, I don't but think we don't there's know going to the be amount. Budget. We don't know yet. Okay. And no, I'm saying, no, 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 that, that will be for 2022, not 2022. Uh -huh. uh -huh. No, 2022. Was there any allocation? No, no. The point is that the amount of money that we have had in the appendix, as he rightly said, is what we're using to commence. And I said, again, that commencement of this project, mobilization, of course, in the eyes of the law, was not even supposed to be existent. But because of this amount of money being there, and because that project is so important, then the government sat down to say, no, let us use this because we had intended to use that for health infrastructure. Let's use this seed capital kind of into it while we plan towards how to execute the projects going forward. Now the question is, where are we going to get the funding? Where are we going to get the funding? Even before the 2022 budget is written or is out, we are here telling government to come and tell us what is going to be inculcated in the budget towards these projects. And I say, let us not jump the gun. Let us not sit here to say things that, of course, are yet to come. And obviously, we are going to see it. The project execution to completion is going to be seen with a greater respect. Monies that are supposed to be allocated for these projects are going to be seen in our uh, you know, subsequent budgets, as it were. So I don't see why we have to sit here and then try to look into whatever to say, we, I propose or I assume or I uh, predict that we're going to have this amount of money in the budget towards this project. Let us wait and look at it. By November, we're going to see the 22 budget, 2022 budget, and we are going to surely be told how the commitment of government is towards these projects, as okay. it were. Dr. Yang said, yeah, well, Mr. Emisa yeah. Mr. Mr. projects some 20 something hospitals. <laughs> that that is his prediction. Of, well, I don't think it's unfair to say that. <laughs> no, because I'm not saying it's, it's unfair. It's, it's similar see, to when prediction. the NDC Jifa, Jifa, started the 120 Jifa. community senior high schools. Uh, um, we all saw mm -hmm. how many were completed after. No, there were 200. The, they promised after 200. After the fact. And they did 47. Okay, so Dr. Yang said, for me, just a moment. I'll come to you. Second, before Doc comes here, I just want to find out ADG. from Doc so you can do it. When you say 100 bed hospital, mm -hmm. is there any technical qualification for what constitutes 100 bed hospital? For instance, in this studio, if we are able to put this studio to host 100 bed for people like outpatient purposes, would they qualify for 100 bed hospital? Because I do know that WHO and all of those things, they have a certain level of classification. <laughs> so that you may as well build an infectious center that can provide... You are delving into ranks that are not hospital. your... <laughs> Does it in and of itself say that you have constructed 100-bed hospital? Okay, Dr. Because Yansen. Because of the cost Okay, so let's hurry, let Dr. Yansen sure. make the point so that we can okay. take a so, break. So, then we so, can delve so, deeper so, into so, that. So I think that probably Kamau was trying to bring some clarity. That one... In terms of the funding, quickly, a certain 600 has been allocated yeah. from last year. This year, in truth, there is no allocation. But hopefully, three months <laughs> from now, when the new budget obviously. is done for 2022, hopefully. we may see some it's massive obvious. infusion in there. Okay. I think government needs to come out clearly and no, tell us. Clear. No, no, no. Come Hold out. On, okay. Mr. I think Mr. We, we, we need to get all these things clearly stated to us so that as citizens we are happy because we all want the project or the agenda to succeed. Now, in terms of energy's question, you see, when we say a 100-bed hospital, we are talking about the capacity in terms of the number of, in quote, beds. Is it just the number no, of No, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> when we say a 100-bed mm -hmm. capacity hospital, you are looking at a minimum 100 beds mm -hmm. within the hospital. Mm -hmm. But those 100 beds could be allocated in so many ways. Mm -hmm. There could be a pediatric wing, mm -hmm. there could be a maternal wing, mm -hmm. there could be a surgical wing, there could be, that is one. Beyond the bed, you need other functional areas. Absolutely. Like administration, you will need other functional areas like say oxygen provision, so the biomedical engineering and all those bits will come in. You may need an OPD, 
you may need a theater and all that. So it's not just about just a structure with 100 beds sitting in there. But there are other ancillary bits Absolutely. that you all need. But ultimately, when you go there, you see it. And if you want a typical example, if you go to Gaiz right now, I think it was one of the Euro Jet projects that was mm -hmm. commissioned before COVID, mm -hmm. just before COVID, I think November 2019. You go there and you see the structures there pr properly laid out, but ultimately the bed capacity will end up there. So there's some ICU for kids, there's some two, three bed for adults, you know, stuff like that. So that is how the 100 bed will look like. It is not just a question of just putting up just because each bed, for example, if you are doing activity properly, should have provision for oxygen gas, uh, so medical gas, say so at the point. So you go into the ward and there's a point where oxygen will be delivered and all that. So th th there are other things. You may even have to get things like uh, CSSD where you size your you know, equipment and all those. So I, I haven't seen all the details, but when we say 100 bed, it is that capacity with all the ancillary. Okay, I'll come back to you still on the 100 bed because I've been looking at a document which is the Ghana Health Service requirement for the 100 bed hospitals. It even talks about the staffing yes. that is required. It's anything from some 250 no, we are not going to, go to into 600 yes. and, and over. So we'll come back to that. But it's still the key points on TV3 and 3FM. Uh, send your messages through to us. We take a quick break. We'll be right back with our guests. Thank you very much for staying with us here on The Key Points. It's been a, an interesting discussion so far. Let's take some of your messages and then we'll speak to the president of the Coalition of NGOs in Health. Uh, quite a lot of them are on this uh, subject. And this one from Aziz and Wa says, protecting the public purse is now building the most expensive district hospital at Shama at a cost of 41 million Ghana cities. Indeed, this government uh, has not been honest with Ghanaians. Um, I'm not sure about the cost of the Shama hospital, I must say. Johnson from Accra says, the trick of the government is that they always come out with fancy, flashy programs without a clear plan and then they pick ideas from the public discussion for implementation this one from um mbabu atamale says thumbs up to you kamal dean uh, inshallah the agenda 111 is doable this government is committed to providing better healthcare infrastructure for the good people of this country and um julius from london says please give us one of the hospitals at nandum um, this one from Koshi says, government communication has been defective in this matter in response to the queries of practicality with prudence of policy. Nobody can be against the construction of more hospital. The issue is about the practicality of constructing 111 hospitals in 18 months without a clear cut funding roadmap. Um, A.U. Farouk from Tamale North says, good morning. Time will tell when the 1-1 hospitals commence because every promise the government has made has yet to be fully fulfilled. And yes, Ghanaians must know where the funding of uh, this uh, 600 uh, million CDs is coming and how it's going to be spent on the agenda 1 hospitals. And a final message from Osman in Tamale says, President Akufuado promised to deliver 88 district hospitals in 2020. 12 months have passed and not a single one of them has been delivered. Agenda 111 is just a rehash. Regards, uh, thank you very much for your messages. So um, Mr. Emisa, um, any thoughts on the last conversation, which is where we are headed about what is the 100 bed hospital? Because there have been criticisms towards the NDC that, well, they built a 100-bed hospital for almost 40 million US dollars. Um, I've seen critiques that we should be commending the current government for seeking to build a 100-bed hospital for half or less than half the cost. Thank you very much, Jifa. So you agree with me that it's very difficult to um, allocate cost to projects depending on the individual's um, um, perspective and then taste. So if we say 100 bed capacity, we might have a standard which we are referencing the WHO standard. Now, a lot of things go into building. It, even if you look at the land, preparation of land, the materials you are going to use, the equipment you are bringing in and so on and forth might determine the, the cost for the projects. So I believe um, the government might have done some feasibility studies 
and and then and all, uh, allocated um, um, sixteen point eight million to this facility. That one I don't want to compare that to the the forty um, million um, dollars um, other people are seeing. But we are just waiting to look at what is in it that makes it a hundred bed capacity. We only want to ensure that it will meet the standard, the WHO standard, where. Um, I would perfectly agree with the expertise that um, 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 Dr. Yansen demonstrated, that we need this, this, and that. The pediatric sessions, the surgical ward, the, 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 all those things are there to make up a district hospital. And then for that matter, we have the number of beds to contain the people whenever um, they come in. So for the cost issues concerning, I, I will relate it to what kind of materials are we using that mm -hmm. is bringing it that, uh, to that amount what equipment are we bringing in, what kind of all those things, and even the land. If, you know, the cost in its sense might not be the same for even every district. The cost, nobody can convince me that the cost of the project probably in Accra will be the same in Kumasi and then the other neighboring um, um, uh, uh, regions and then districts. So in each case, I see it to be an average is the 16.8 million. And for that matter, I believe we could have some which are even more than 20 million, some which are up to about 30, and some probably less than about 16 in that sense. So I don't want to go so technical on that since I'm, I don't have um, so much expertise, but I know that you know, we cannot limit ourselves to the good standards, which we are all looking at from the, the, the WHO um, baselines. So for cost issues, let's leave it to the, to the technical people to tell us more and then we, we pick it up from there. It Thanks. could be very, very relative, I think. All right. Thanks very much, Mr. Emisa. And I'll come back to Dr. Yangson quickly on the hospital, because he mentioned the WHO standard. The document I was looking at was a, a Ministry of Health document, uh, 2018, 2019. Is it possible that the standard is the same, or it is downgraded a bit? I mean, this document came with data. It came with even the floor plan, design plan, and the like. Well, what, what it is is that there, there, there's generally, <laughs> let's say the WHO standard, uh, that is supposed to be a guide for all nations, mm -hmm. depending on your resources as a country and the level of care you want to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. These WHO standards will not bind you, so to speak. A great but answer. It sets a certain minimum parameter or answer. basic parameter for you. So what is important <laughs> now is, as a state, as a people, what have we developed as our concept? Absolutely. And we are going to borrow, or we have borrowed a lot from this WHO arrangement to suit our own. So it's like domesticating that bigger framework document to suit the needs of your country. But in healthcare delivery, if you are going to do the best for your people, then there are some minimums you cannot go below. So we expect that when we get full details out of this particular Agenda 1 bit, whether it's a district hospital or the regional hospital, no when the full details are given, we can then do a better assessment or critique, if any, to see whether at least it meets the minimum benchmarks. Well, the president did talk about it in his speech. Yeah, so I, I, mean, I think that this uh, That is for be... the district. But the reason why I'm asking then is then, Mr. Tamaklo, how then do you explain the criticism that the NPP is delivering a district hospital at half the cost that was delivered no, by no, the Mahama you, administration? You say, you say that is where the deception is. You see, you cannot, with the greatest respect, provide 100 beds, okay, within this room, and still call it 100 bed hospital. That's not what it is, please. It's okay? not that simple. You should because, not listen to the oh, doctor. please. Oh, come on. The it president is, mentioned yeah. that there will be a maternity. No, I'm, I'm coming there. He I'm, mentioned there will be no, maternity, there will be theaters. He also mentioned that it Jifa, even comes Jifa, with staff accommodation, Jifa, a radiology I'm unit. There. You yes. see, the vice president organizes a forum and critique the previous administration that he does not understand why 100 bed hospitals should call $25 million. And then even exclaim, a bay. <laughs> this was the vice president. <laughs> now, the same government now decides to do 100 bed hospital in Shama for 35 million euros. That's $41 million. Then we say, ah, you cannot in one breath criticize $25 million for 100 bed, and then now do 35 million euros for the same 100 bed. What goes into it? Then they came and said, look, 
the tooling, the equipment that you'll be putting in, even who the manufacturer is, whether you are leasing, all of this thing is the reason why the Shama one is costing 35 million euros. That's to, uh, 41 million and not 25 that you critique the NDC for. That is why it is critical in this conversation to know this particular 100 bed, where is the model coming from? Is it WHO specification? Or, like Dr. Yangtze said, a local you know, idea of how a 100 bed hospital. If we do that conversation, then you realize that, in fact, your 60 million dollars is like building an Atacuame house. And another person built Atacuame house course, which is four bed, you know, it's four bed. Then you also do block, four, uh, four bedroom. You cannot compare the two. So we need to know what exactly is going into this. Now, the problem is that, you see, there's so much opacity relative to the rollout of this particular agenda 111 project. Are you saying it because it's being managed from the presidency? No, I am not saying it because it is being managed. You see, when things are done, for instance, from agencies of state, people can easily, you know, walk in, find out what is the nature of the design, what exactly is going into it. If I look at this scenario, you have a situation where the president you know, chairs a committee, right? And we are being told in, the, in this particular rollout, the president chairs this committee, and at times, the chief of staff does it. It is not the ministry per se that is ruling it out. It is being ruled out at the presidency. Now, question, what was the procurement methodology used? We have been told that for the design, the architectural design, it was done by one David uh, Ajay or something the person who designed the National Cathedral project. Question, were these architectural design processes done in a competitive manner? Because in most instances, what you do is that you invite designs, architectural design. People bring different kinds of design. Then you will indicate that, look, from all the designs I picked, this one situates within that local conversation. So I'm going for this particular architect to do this. In this particular case, we are only being told, in fact, based on the, the, the works that the architect had put online, that we have even seen that he's the one who had designed this, all the hospital projects, and it's the same design, except that the locality is different. Now, if you have this situation, you cannot now be saying that I am doing my uh, 60 million, and so there is value for money with mine. Because you, the same person, you are doing 100 bed hospital in Shama for 35 million euros. How come that the Shama one is costing 35 million euros? And then the 88 is costing 16 million. The same person. It is no different government. So you need to address us on this critical difference, even in cost. Okay. That is the only way you can carry us as citizens along. Mr. Kamal, yeah. Diva. I think we've moved from cost now and from the doubt now to looking at the uh, technical aspect of the project and making com some comparisons. Let me bring Edg back if he has forgotten. In 2016, they earmarked some eight districts to have hospitals being built. Oh, Mr. Kamal, no, they are no, expecting no, Diffa, 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 you to go Diffa, back. Diffa, I thought you were just no, no, launched Oh, no, no, Diffa, don't do this. Diffa, <laughs> let's have a conversation. Obviously, he makes reference to things in the past and then tell or give us the reason why he think he still doubt or they still doubt this project. Equally, I should be given the permission to tell Ghanaians that indeed, time passed, the very people who claim they are the best alternative to managing the affairs of this country, okay, we had seen them making certain promises and never delivered. Okay, so you, can you just So I just simply said, the, uh, what the I want to say is that not too long ago, in 2016, they abandoned some eight districts, projects, hospitals that they earmarked to build. Apart from those work that they completed, the rest in Kumeu, in Wa, Formina, and all that, zero. Today, a president comes out to say no. Primary health care must be given a boost. We need hospitals dotted around the country, especially in our districts. Drawings have been done. 
discussions have been done on how to fund it. It's going to be fully a GOG funding. We are going to make sure that we think out of the box to get this. Now we sit here, even before the third project gets to even 2% or 1% level, we are all casting doubts. Like I said, we are focused and will remain focused and ensure that this will be done. You see, when you said to make comparison, I'm, 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 when you said to make comparison, that yesterday a hospital was being challenged or the cost of a hospital was being challenged. And today, we are coming out to build a particular hospital at a particular cost and saying, that, look, let us try to match that to the WHO standards. I am happy with the response um, Doc gave. The reason why I said it was fantastic. Point he made, every locality or every society have their own, if you like, um, you know, way of building a scope to meet a particular standard. Why? Difa, the NDC and EDG wants us to credit them for building chip chips compound. They want us to gloat. I mean, they want to gloat over chips compound, but they are not happy that some $17 million is going to be injected into providing a facility that will meet a particular standard Mr. within our jurisdiction. Mr. Abdul, I, I, I have to address my question it, because the question is... Diva, what's your question? The question mm -hmm. is the $17 mm -hmm. million dollar hospital, district hospital mm -hmm. being provided. Yeah. What is the detail of the 100 bit? As we sit here, we have all seen the Is it going to be like the Shama one, which we, costs more? As we sit here. Or it has been, uh, there is a protect. Yes. Okay. So maybe the building exactly. may be built in a manner that does not engage. That's what we are asking. Hey. As we sit here, we have seen the artistic impression of the hospitals <laughs> that are going to be built, haven't we? Yes. Mm? yes. Brought out by the designer, haven't we seen it? Yes, sir. We have seen aspects looking at same including my good brother, who is a doctor here, who has been, who is a health personnel as well. Looking at same, we have actually seen again the provision of the explanation that some $4 million out of the $17 million will go into procuring equipment for the said facility. But the actual cost for the building and structural, uh, what's the name? Structural um, facility the setup or setup is, is going to be some $12 million. million. So I think that's now the these fundamental. Details, these so details the fundamental, have been provided. Yes. So the this, fundamental thing is that the $4 million equipment being provided for this 100 mm -hmm. bed certainly may not be the same as Ashama. what has been provided at Shama, for instance. Zifa, it is so clear that maybe if we should go into the details of what Shama was supposed to be and look at the scope of work that has been provided in the contract, maybe different from the scope of work of this particular okay, contract. So, prob maybe. so probably but, but there was scope, see, creep, what? Of, of, scope creep maybe see, that added but on, on the a few other of it, things. You don't just sit down and say that the core Shama was going to be 35 million um, euro or dollars or whatever, then we cannot build a hospital costing 17 million dollars. That would be a very weak argument you are making. Point is, if the drawings and all the discussion that has gone on has said that, look, it suffices to say we can use $17 million to build this particular facility. And aspects also set on to say, look, what we have done, it meets the standards, at least per our standard. Okay? Juxtaposing same to maybe international standard, you can look at it, which we are in categories. Maybe you may choose to go for $300 million standard, you can choose to go for $200 million, depending on your thinking, anyway. Okay? But of course, is it also feasible to have a hospital? Is it also feasible to have a hospital costing 17 million US dollars? And are aspects yeah, also okay on that? That's why I said okay, I will so look at what I'm he said. I'm glad you, you said that because yeah. when I was looking at the Ghana Health mm -hmm. Service document, it yes. talks about various categories. Well. There's category A, mm -hmm. there's category B, mm -hmm. category C, category D mm -hmm. for these primary health care uh, facilities. Yeah. You know, so it may be. Depending on what category it is, that's what we are getting the 17 million for. The they've, they've always said, they've always yeah. said the devil is in the details. And I believe that, yes, what we have done so far is, is, is not out of place. And like I said, they have looked into it and aspects have looked at it. Quantity surveyors who also have, you know, the, the consultants who also have eyes to determine whether this amount of money can get us this structure have all gone into this matter. Okay. What we have to do now. Let us be positive at least for once okay. as a people All right. and get this project I don't think, supported I don't think and anyone is, is negative about it. They but are, Dr. But Dr. Yang, and I think negative. the point I, I sought to clarify is that I know that even at the primary care level, mm -hmm. there are categories of the hospitals, A, B, C, and D. 
And so we don't know what this set of this set of hospital being built, whether it falls under category A, B, C, or D. <laughs> that then determines the cost. Oh, I have to mm. raise it because, no, 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 because it also question. determines your staffing situation. It also does determine the staffing situation. I, I think that for this particular agenda, what we've been made to understand is that we are going to have the district hospitals, you know, 103 of them, which will meet our basic standard as set out in our policy documents. So for me, once we are meeting our basic standards, of course, our standards also mirror a lot of the things within the WHO standards. So once we are going to meet the basic standards, let's get the detail and then we can all do it in terms of quantifying the cost. But what Kamal is saying, or what government has said for all of us to hear is that they have already put the experts in place, they have done all the figures, and this is the conclusion they have come to. What I will urge government is that in all this 101, uh, 101 you know, projects, one, generally speaking, there should be value for money, and as much as possible, we should avoid unnecessary cost overruns. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. as a country, yeah. a lot of times, we do these things, and it goes back to there's like a lot of scope, we, 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 scope creep we, we, we as need, well. Yes, we, we, we need to plow back, you know, a lot of the funds we have into the operational ends and what have you, because beyond the structures and everything, when operationally you have difficulties, then you are not also giving the service that you want. So I think that one government should take note of. The next one is the cost of maintenance. Many a time we build facilities, there are grand, you know, ceremonial activities and all that. The official dom will leave, go back to their place in a couple of years, and it's in a very a terrible state. No. So there should be clear activity when it comes to maintenance. And these guidelines, we should enforce them such that it becomes mandatory to have that quarter of maintenance in our communities. No, no. Okay, can so, I just so, yeah, so yeah, 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 point from you like, and then I have to take... A simple um, question from Doc, maybe mm, so you yeah. can dovetail. Yes. You see, we are looking at a more localized conversation in terms of 100 bed. You are general secretary... You are so obsessed with the, this 100 bed. Please. Man. You are so... <laughs> you are a member of the professional body <laughs> of doctors, Ghana Medical mm. Association. At the point of implementation, did you have a member oh. on the committee. Okay. You see, the reason why oh. I'm asking this is that, that is you are not, talking about project again, meeting no. specification. Why? Did it have an input from the professional body of doctors? Because ultimately, oh, come on. they are edit, going to edit, man these hospitals. It's critical. This is not for You doctor. cannot say that this you are building for hospital for doctors that you are going without to an input the from the doctors. Is, I'm not saying it's out of place, no. But that no, so that's why I'm is, asking him. Do they have, have a rep on it? It's a simple question. Oh, no. But the Minister of Health was is ah. leading this as well. Yes, but the professional body. This is a okay, a quick business. one and we need to wrap up. Okay, okay. So, government business. So for us as Ghana Medical Association, in terms of this specific project, we were not part of the committee. But what we have been made to understand is that the basis was based on the policy document that had already been developed. Good. And in some of these documents, in terms of <laughs> development in the past... Look, let me quickly oh, add this. No, 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 wait, let him finish. Let me tell you as well. <laughs> when, when, when they were going to build the, over to whatever 2,000 they claim, <laughs> Chief's compound, did they invite you? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Were you invited? No, no. Did they, did they invite no. you? When, when, they, when, when they said they were going to forgo their salaries to build Chief's compound, did they invite no. you? No. So where is this question coming from? <laughs> Come on. Let's, okay, let's, so, let's, okay, let's, okay, that's... So just your final point. Yeah. So, Where's this question coming from? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that when the government is going to implement the policy, you go out there and be looking for CSOs to come and okay, so the my, don't my, 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 don't get uh, my last bit, my last <laughs> bit yes, has to do ultimately with you know the operational and the staffing. Please, most of these facilities <laughs> are going to be in the district. We yeah, all know the yeah. nature of our development. It is skewed in terms of social infrastructure towards the bigger cities. Government must ensure that they put in the right motivational incentives to attract and retain healthcare professionals in there. There should also be the culture of training of the professionals who will endeavor to serve in those areas. These are very key things because now 
the private sector, the quasi-government sectors within the, the, the health structure are also growing. And there's competition for the same kind of people. And for the districts, usually, you find government being the entity operating there in terms of the delivery of healthcare services. If we don't put in the right structures... Like in proper terms of, schools and other... No, facilities. beyond so all that, those bases, so that you, will need, you, you, you will need to have some incentives in place so that, that will ensure that it will be attractive to people. Because the truth is that you cannot compel anybody to work for a particular there. employer. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yamsa. Uh, Kamala, I have to stop you because you've made your point. Oh. Final point with uh, Mr. But I have my Emisa. final point to make. Yes, uh, Mr. Emisa. I have a final point. In, in, yes, in, thank in, you very much, Jifa. So yeah. for us, we, we want to say we, we provide our blessings in support of the project to, to this government. Very good. We are only questioning that it moves in a pace where it is very healthy to, it will. to the government itself and the people of Ghana. And for that matter, we want to see um, some of the projects um, 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 being functional by the time he leaves office, but not the scattered lots where they are not um, completed. So it will be great to see some of them are raised and are functioning, and then we, we point our hands and say, in another government, these um, district facilities came into being than leaving a lot, excuse my language, in the bush that are not functional, that we cannot point to any. So right. we provide our support, we provide our blessings to it, and then we, we, we the beneficiaries, would wish that um, it comes to fruition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that's uh, where we bring this segment to an end. Our guest, uh, Edu Jitamaklo, NDC uh, legal team member, Mr. Kamal Dean Abdullahi, MPP Deputy Communications Director, Dr. Justice Youngson, GMA's uh, General Secretary General, is it General Secretary rather, and Mr. Bright Emisanyako, National uh, President of the Coalition of NGOs in Health. He's a man we'll of many parts. We'll take a quick break. <laughs> and when we come back, we'll take uh, our next topic which is focusing on the Akufuado government's anti-corruption agenda. Is it real or perceived? We'll be right back. <laughs> Points. And my name is Jifa Bampo. It's also live on 3news.com as well as our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. You can continue to send your messages to 055-369-8789. Now, government's anti-corruption agenda, is it a myth or it's a reality? Well, the president has said his commitment to fight corruption remains high and unparalleled. His opposite um, uh, colleague, that is former President John Mahama, has said that he fought corruption better than the current president. So where does that leave you and I, the citizen? Now, the president recently met um, civil society um, members in the anti-corruption space and tried to give some perspective to his fight against corruption. In recent times, the president had been criticized about how he dispensed of the services of former, act, uh, former Auditor General Daniel Domelevu. He was also uh, criticized for not taking a strict action against the boss for the Public Procurement Authority who was engaged in a cash uh, for sale contract deal and many others as well. There's reference to even um, accusations about the Ejapa deal, the recent deal relating to ECA and GNPC. So really, is the president uh, walking the talk when it comes to anti-corruption? Let's hear some thoughts from him. I think we're all aware of the circumstances in which the first auditor, when I say the first, the first auditor general in my time left office and seemed to presage some disputation between him and my government, between him and myself, and somebody had to act in this place. I felt that it was important that that person should be given sufficient time to develop the confidence of the population rather than to rush to an appointment which may, which could also have given the impression that that is the reason why we acted against the first order to tell to remove him from office and plant somebody perhaps more pliant, more 
successful. I believe the one who succeeded him, who came to succeed him by natural order in, 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 in the hierarchy there, has not demonstrated sufficient quality, independence of view. For instance, he's responsible for something that is unheard of in our history, the 12 statutory reports that have to be compiled and placed before Parliament in the year of Parliament. This is the first time it has ever been done. Even the most outed Auditor General before never managed to do it. This one has done it. I think that on the basis of the work that he has done and the, and the, and the, the independence with which he has gone about his work, if today efforts are made to confirm him, which I believe should be done, that confirmation process will gather more public support than if it had been rushed immediately after the, after the unfortunate exit of the first. As I say, um, the circumstances in which the first Auditor General left, to some extent, constrained me in the manner in which I responded to his success. But yes, um, do I understand that in fact, the process has begun. It has begun. Yes. What is it? Is, it is recommended, and it's on, is it going to go to the, uh, the the Council of State? Yeah. So all those those processes are already in there. But, it, I, but to, to put it in its context, yes, I agree. And that's the president just speaking uh, this week. Our guest this morning, Dr. Yao Graham, coordinator of the Third World Network, one of the foremost pioneers in civil society in reference to extractives and the environment. Dr. Kojo Asante, uh, director of policy engagement and advocacy at CDD Ghana. Edwiji Tamaklo, NDC's legal team, and Kamal Dean Abdullah, MPP, uh, deputy communications director. I'll turn first to Dr. Yao Graham. Thanks very much, Dr. Graham, for joining us. And it's not often we get to speak with you. Uh, so glad to really have you on the program. So the current Akufuado administration has uh, seen a number of issues, the most recent one being the ACA GMPC saga. We've seen the procurement issues relating to Sputnik V, where the deputy health minister violated uh, procurement laws. We've had the PPA boss who has not been prosecuted for engaging in a cash for sale contract deal. Meanwhile, we are now seeing prosecutions for Collins Dowda et al. We've seen how uh, Mr. Domlevo uh, left office and also excavators that got uh, lost under a special purpose vehicle when the Galamse fight was at its height sometime in 2020. And then there's been the thought of uh, gagging of individuals who've been critical of the government. What are your thoughts about whether the president is walking his talk? Yeah, uh, good morning, uh, Jifa and uh, the colleagues on the panel who I can't see because I'm on Zoom. And also good morning to your, to, to, to your listeners and, and viewers. Um, I think the, clearly the perception in society, and not only among uh, a few civil society organizations about whether the government is doing a good job on corruption or not uh, has to be seen with a, a wider lens beyond what is in the Auditor General's report because people experience government at so many levels at the district level and also all the way to the national and also in different spheres of their lives whether it's in public procurement how people get hired for the public service, uh, which businesses are favored, even which neighborhoods uh, get uh, allocation of money uh, from, from public uh, investment. So it, I think it's the totality of people's experiences, really, that people express a view about whether there's patronage and corruption uh, in the government or not. Secondly, I think most citizens are not interested, really, in a comparative discussion of corruption. I think we'll be letting ourselves down if we think the low standards for dealing with corruption under the uh, uh, Mahama government uh, has become a, set, a kind of benchmark against which to measure the Akufuado government. 
I mean, egregious corruption by anybody, I think, is worthy of being criticized and being, and being challenged. So on, on that basis, I mean, the public have set a standard of expectation of their leaders. And clearly, in terms of how people are expressing themselves about the corruption, the president is right when he talks about the uh, uh, about budgetary allocations and so on and so forth. But at the same time, uh, there are some signal things which point to him being rather thin-skinned, you know, and uh, reacting uh, uh, in, in ways which are a bit over the top. Take, for example, the attack on Professor Jimabu. That really was not befitting of the presidency, you know. I mean, because really, was Jimabu being personal in what he expressed, you know, that basically the thing about him got personal. The 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 the, 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 the coalition anti-corruption corruption, corruption uh, and extractive corruption that uh, I've been involved in. I mean, somebody leaked uh, a meeting. That person has been put up to it because we're deemed to be critics of the government. And, you know, uh, a, 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 an article with the same import, same headline, was splashed across pro-government publications claiming that we were engaged in an anti-Ghana, you know, uh, exercise. Anti-Ghana, really? That a ruling government becomes the country and the rest of us who are not part of it, are not part of the country, is speaking your mind an act of treason? I mean, I think these are the bigger issues that come into view in terms of how some of these things are. And even during the year, uh, so it's not simply the president. I think we should be talking about the culture of administrations. Because, you know, in a way, when uh, people in a ruling party, particularly leading members, speak publicly and angrily about the entitlement of members of the, of the party to jobs, you know, and to contracts, to the exclusion of orders. I mean, this is a, basically a declaration of privilege, uh, not based on merit or due process, simply because people are in power. People hear these things, and there's no criticism of that position. There's no pushback. So people are entitled to feel that are well. I mean, it's a free for all, limited to those who are close to power. So I think this is a wider lens we, we need to bring. And finally, I think the, the fight against corruption also, I mean, because so many institutions and agencies have to be involved, we have to ask the question, you know, about, about the landscape uh, of, 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 of how the intervention of different uh, actors are, 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 are treated. Because ultimately, really, I mean, we the citizens make or make government. If those who yesterday were our peers, who we have elected into office to, to, to run the country for us, uh, and also put some in parliament to serve as an opposition, suddenly become, in a way, untouchable because of the political decision that we have taken, then we have a problem. Mm. Thanks very much, Dr. Graham. Let me come to Kamal Dean, because <clears throat> ultimately, um, the buck stops with the president. And I was looking at some data put up by the Ghana report, and they tried to do a summation of how many times corruption has been referenced um, over the last 20 years. And it is deemed that in the last sonus, that is in terms of the state of the nation address, that's the document that was analyzed, the president said nothing about it in the last two sonus. Well, so it, it gives even a certain sense that this is something the Akufuado administration doesn't even want to talk about. They don't want to reference. I gave you some examples. I know Dr. Graham says we should look at it from the wider perspective. Absolutely. Yes, but the point is mm -hmm. this, this administration, people had hope that they would really tackle corruption and many are disappointed. Well, thank you very much. Um, Diva, corruption in itself is a canker we must all fight. In government, without government, or out of government, you have an obligation to fight corruption. Part of the media, whether you work with your private person, whatever, all of us owe it a duty to ensure that corruption is fought to the fullest. But sadly, Difa, 
we narrow the fight against corruption and limit it only to people in authority. And it's a very sad situation for all of us. It will continue. And that brings to fore the polarization of our own system. So that the fact that we have limited it to only people in authority, and for that matter, politicians, then it is only politicians who speak and we think that we are all fighting against corruption. However, like Doc said, it ought to be broadened. Let us broaden the scope. Let's get all inclusive on the fight against corruption. Why do we have the Whistleblowers Act? Was it for just stating in the book's purposes? That is why we enacted such laws. Why do we sit here and we have laws against corruption? Was it just for the spectacle of it? No. Now, for someone to say that I expect the authorities in place to fight corruption, the person is not wrong. Because even before we come to power, our manifestos as political parties, we indicate therein that we are going to fight corruption and we're going to do this to fight corruption. But you see, with recourse to the legal architecture of our land, Doc is here, Edigy is here, I am here, but Jifa, you are here. I wake up one morning to say I am going to make an accusation against, or I'm going to accuse Jifa of some wrongdoing, which points to corruption. And because I have come or I've had a platform to make such allegations, with that recourse to the legal architecture, which tells you how to go procedurally, Jifa must be chastised, Jifa must be vilified. Is that what the way to go? No. So, you see, when you look at the fight against corruption, like I rightly said, CSOs, Whoever is involved, all of us owe it a duty to speak up. But then the point now, is, Mr. Kamal now, Dean, yeah. the point is, Mr. Mm -hmm. Kamal Dean, even in these instances where you say there must be recourse to a yeah. legal process, I mean, look at what happened under the fight against illegal mining. Mm -hmm. A special purpose vehicle was created to deal with uh, the excavators that were seized and the like. They disappeared. No but, one has been held to account for so that. So the matter is closed. Is that correct? As far as I have heard or seen, oh, I haven't seen it. You are saying that emphatically that that matter is closed. I haven't no seen. investigation is ongoing. All I know, all is, that I know is that some illegal miners caught later on. So to your are knowledge, under, yes. so to your knowledge is that some were caught. But that is but, that, but that but is you one cannot example. say with all certainty that that matter is closed. You cannot say that. All right. Then the so, PPA see, boss, I'm just giving uh, these uh, examples ahead, because ahead. No, it's important. Happened. It's important. Mention the, them. The PPA you know, boss can I, can I was correct, uh, misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. Yes. In talking about the breath, I was not talking about the fact that everybody has a duty to fight corruption. That was not the point I mean. I was talking about the breadth of how government power is used across the realm of power. I, contrary to what Kamal was saying, I believe that the reason why people are focused on government because government controls our collective resources and has been vested with power from the national to the local government level across sectors to manage those resources for the benefits of all of us. So I think it's important to underline that my point is that the focus on government and corruption is correct. So not to say that I'm saying that somehow all of us, you know, are, are accountable because I don't manage any budget. <laughs> so okay. that's so, yeah. so, so focus, so, but, doc, doc okay. focus so, so on doc, public corruption. Doc, thanks for bringing public us to that okay. perspective because that's the fine. reality is that mm -hmm. some, these examples are given, they are not um, perceived. Yeah. It's not a case of someone sleeping and waking up and wanting to accuse another person. We are not seeing the kind of actions that give confidence that the president and his administration are walking Differ the talk. The attorney general is prosecuting Collins Dowda. Very well. But yet the PPA boss, Mr. AJ, mm -hmm. ha is, is not uh, and, in and, the wings. And, and I've asked a simple question again. We are all aware that the PPA boss matter was referred to the special prosecutor. Is that correct? supposed to be have been okay i think it's supposed to be in, to be on investigation as we speak right now then i ask you a simple question whether the matters you have raised have been brought to an end close case close finish as far as i that's know the, mr charles bc is still going is. about his normal duties and and of course that does not mean that investigation why with even within our legal palace why people commit crimes to the extent that even those days we have we're told that in court you don't even have bail for better cases today 
somebody went to Supreme Court and then made sure that a judgment was secured to say that every single crime in this country is bailable. Is that not so? So the point that VCU is working out does not mean that the matter on under investigation has been brought to an end. That's not what it means. And you see, crime is not an expiry, it's not ideal milk where you can have an expiry date on it. <laughs> you know that. So the point I want to make is let us not create an impression out there that if A, B, C, D has been done, because I want to just see the person put into prison without recourse to Article 19, which gives you procedure and declares each and every one innocent until proven guilty, then let us chastise and let us go out there and then finish the people and move on. Yes, I will be happy to see pragmatic steps taken, concrete steps taken towards the fight against corruption. Because it is a bigger problem for all of us. And I'll be very happy about it. The rhetorics within that area must be avoided completely. That I agree. You get what I mean? But the point is, in that same vein, we do not sit down to say that, look, the fact that A has happened and B has happened, for that matter, holistically, let us chastise the government of Nana Adedon Kufado, and then go sit down. Why? Yesterday, John Dramani Mahama was the president. Before him, there were other presidents. We are building a nation and coming forward. CSOs are out there and they are talking and it's good. Media is out there and they're supposed to be the fourth estate of the realm and of course keep us in check and it's good. Other institutions that are supposed to be built to help us get the fight of corruption put uh, on the banner is also good. Like for example, the SP. If we have gone through all this, gradually we're moving. But you see, we cannot throw our hands in despair. And then, of course, out of the blue, say, because this has happened, oh, it means that we cannot fight corruption. I think that is a very I, bad I don't think it's a case of we cannot we fight have. corruption. No, we are the, fighting the, it. the perception is that there is no political will in this current administration uh, to fight corruption. Let me bring uh, in Dr. There Fulbasan. will not be political will when, 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 when we sit down and say that, look, let's put in place institutions that will make corruption a high risk, if you like, adventure to all of us. Then we do that, we go to parliament, we put them together, and then we ensure that matters are referred to them and investigated. What we ought to be doing now is to push such institutions to ensure that if a matter is brought before you, expedite action on them. Okay, so I'll hold you there. Uh, Dr. Asante, I know that at the time that um, Mr. Domelevo was pushed out of office, you were quite vocal about that. Kamal Dean talks about having systems in place and having the organizations do what they are supposed to do. So yes, we have the Office of the Special Prosecutor, you have the Attorney General's Office, you have Shraj, uh, for instance, and all of that. I mean, are we just picking at the surface or this is really just about political will? Thank you and uh, good, good morning to everybody, uh, to your viewers. Uh, first of all, let me just, just reiterate something that, uh, for me, corruption is an existential threat to our democracy, our very young democracy, to our institutions. And there's a lot of things that have happened uh, in the last couple of years that has even weakened the, uh, the structures uh, for fighting corruption. And you know, I, I sometimes, uh, uh, you know, I, well, I, I shouldn't say I struggle. I can understand where political actors come from when, when you know, uh, when you are in power, you see things differently. But if we don't tackle corruption, uh, we really risk uh, a lot of things and things that people have fought for. Uh, for many years to sort of restore this democracy and, and try to build institutions that would deliver on, on, on the development process, you know, for, for the welfare of many Ghanaians. So uh, it's the kind of reason why we, are, we get agitated and uh, we speak, you know, with passion about, about corruption. The, the a number of disagreements we, we I have, I, let me use, let me say I, because <laughs> I think uh, I've with the president, um, and I've had the opportunity at least twice uh, to sit across the table uh, and discuss these issues. And I think we have some fundamental disagreements about how he perceives issues of corruption. One of them, and if you read the president's defense of his commitment to uh, uh, the anti-corruption fight, it's 
around a couple of issues. Investment in the institutions, investigative bodies, proctorial bodies, and so on. The very same things that Kamal is sure. referring to. Um, <laughs> he's talked about how he's resourced the, he resourced the Auditor General, he resourced the, the Attorney General, uh, Shraj, and others, so, and so on. He talked about uh, savings that were made through the um, procurement, you know, some reforms around the procurement processes. He's talked about uh, the need to follow due process and so on. Uh, and I, every time, and this is, this is the same defense that he has made since he made that <laughs> statement uh, I think I was a Ghana Bar Association. Yeah, Ghana Bar Association. After the ABIJ yeah. uh, yes. matter. matter. Right. And I think that oh, it's not enough. The chakra in the verbiage. It, yeah, it's not enough because, you see, the outcomes don't match the investment. So at the minimum, if you are putting money in something or you, you're pushing resources in something and you're not seeing the, the, the outcomes, the first thing, just from a public policy perspective, is to ask yourself, ah, am I wasting my resources? Maybe it's not directed to, you know, uh, uh, to the right places. And why are we saying that? Look at the perception index over the last 10 years. We, the, the picture is one of stagnation. You maybe just make a notch up, you fall. You make a notch up, you fall. But we've not hit the uh, past mark ever for the last 10 years. Even before that, we've not hit it as a country. So when you want to measure whether or not, just from a perception point of view, there's no, the Alpha Barometer surveys in terms of ranking of corruption, and these are ranking of perceived corruption of even the institutions that are mandated to fight corruption. Mm -hmm. So how, how are we even supposed to get there? So, and that has not changed. If you look at the Auditor General's report across, it has not changed, all right? So the outcomes don't match the investment. So at the minimum, we should ask questions. Is it that we are doing it wrong? Is it that we are not going further? If the president, if you have given people money, resources, and they are not producing the outcome, shouldn't you decide, okay, well, maybe you are not the right man for the job. Maybe we need to change something else. We are not getting that kind of conversation. Because if at the end of uh, Nana Kufuado's uh, government, he says, my achievement is that I resourced uh, the anti-corruption institutions. And yet every indices tells us that our corruption uh, fight is stagnated. What, what, what is the legacy? So for me, that is where I have a, trouble, uh, a problem with the president. The second is that Every time we had discussions around corruption, the, the way I sit, the perception I get from, or what I perceive from hearing the president is that, unless you are caught with money, stuffing money in your pocket, in, in the eyes of the president, that's not corruption. You are not corrupt. No, I, I think if you are not caught categorically where you are taken through a process, he cannot take any action without proof. Not necessarily. When I, I want to, I'm making a, this a specific point uh, I'm making about it, that he draws a line between ethical conduct and corruption. He doesn't see certain types of behavior as corrupt behavior, right? Because for him, personal gain is important. So if you have not gotten personal gain out of a, a process, then he doesn't, you know, he doesn't see that as a. And I, for example, the the health minister uh, debate that we have been having, for instance, right? Clear uh, uh, breaches of procurement rules. You go to the procurement uh, uh, public procurement authority act. Look at the financial management act. There's nobody. I mean, it's been established for you know whatever all the breaches. But you can't establish a personal gain. And so the person has not basically, it's not corrupt behavior, right? But it does it, the, the point is that we, even for causing fin uh, financial loss in this country, right? When we prosecute people for causing, a lot of the charges is really are taking decisions without board approval. 
you know, all of that. We removed Charlotte Osei on procurement breaches. No personal gain was established. But, and it's for a reason. Because the starting point of crop behavior is conflict of interest, nepotism, influence peddling, and then if you're able to establish something in terms of whether the person, I'm like in the ABNJ, well. ABN, ABN, ABNJ's case, for instance, where there's clear evidence that he has profited from, from, from his, his, his transactions. And we are yet to see you know, any action taken on that, right? Then, if you don't tackle, if you don't recognize how important it is to deal with that as a signal that this kind of behavior is not allowed, then it creates more perception that, oh, oh, I mean, if, you know, if this is allowed, then if I'm at a district, uh, I'm a DCE at a district, uh, whatever, uh, uh, I can also do the same. Mm. And that is a fundamental problem I have. With, no. with, what, with what we are seeing With, with what we are seeing. And, 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 Doc, just and, one second. And I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I want, to, I want Doc to sure. just want clarity. Doc, one second. On the ABAJ matter, yeah. has it been brought to closure? But I have a problem also with that. It hasn't because been brought to closure. Because I have, and, and I'll no, come but out. It, no, yeah, okay. come out, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I, Mm -hmm. One of the one of the projects that uh, mm -hmm. uh, we support is the Corruption Watch. Yeah. Since 2017, even cases that were pending before that, the AB Crenshaw case in the Standard Authority, mm -hmm. that case was well done even before uh, the MPP came into power. Mm -hmm. uh, from that time, Yoko has investigated that case for forever. <laughs> it's still investigating. It's still investigating <laughs> to the point that the Auditor mm -hmm. General has gone back. You know to cite that, that, that issue, you know. And you have many cases where it never is brought to a closure. Okay. The reason why Corruption Watch was actually brought was because for, if you take, like, we never it close was, cases. It was a way to kind yes, of track and follow the cases. Because we never close cases. Mm -hmm. And this is, has been the culture. So every you, know, you go, we are investigating, we are investigating. But that is part of that if you want to fight corruption, you have to Even close. that, Absolutely. there has to be some targets. Okay. Uh, Edward, I'll come to you, but I just want to pick Dr. Graham's thoughts on some interesting things that um, Dr. Asante has raised. It seems our systems have suffered some weakness. Then there seems to be this dichotomy between what is ethical conduct and what is, you know, corruption. There seems to be a lack of fairness, though, and that then also has created a certain free for all do you think that may be the case i mean the in general because of uh, the, the the culture around power you know that when you have power it gives you a certain freedom you know to 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 engage in acts of patronage and allocation of resources, you may not benefit directly, as as could you explain, but you create a culture where basically you are using power, you know, in ways which are inappropriate. Because this is a corruption thing. He makes an important point about it's not necessarily about personal gain. So let me take some examples about how, when it comes to let's say uh, uh, even decisions about where public resources will be spent, you go to certain parts of Accra neighborhoods where some people in, in, in power live. Those things, they are better roads than people in, on the next street, okay? Now, that decision may not have been taken by the beneficiaries, but it's an example. People, you find those kinds of things. When it comes to employment, certain people are favored. The due process, open access of all citizens, it is generally known that all those things have been compromised. So, uh, so I think it's, it's important. And also the ethical part of, of, it, of, of the, 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 the symbolism, therefore, what is okay to do when in power becomes kind of institutionalized. And I think the thing about, therefore, even the decision what to bring to closure in terms of, 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 of uh, 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 prosecution and the method of also closure. Why do you ask for somebody to resign? And we say, no, no, this is not a resigning issue. All those things point to a certain perception that the threshold for accountability 
And we are defining accountability in a very broad sense. Mm. You know, and the standards that define accountability mm. are pretty uneven on one side and very low where it ought to apply. Yeah, and depending different. on where you are located yeah. politically. Yeah, and if I, right. you see, so, just, just, yes. just, just, just uh, two, just two points. Every case that I have looked at starts with conflict of interest, nepotism, influence peddling, all the the things that you basically say are just you know, ethical behavior from you NCA case, you all of those things, right? But the thing about personal gain and within. And a, a broader accountability spectrum is that people think personal gain is only about you. You you benefit personally. No. If you are doing it because you want to favor a third party, you're not. It's not coming to you directly. There's a gain anyway. There's a gain because you your whatever that third party provides you, and it could be just uh, family, uh, emotional, you know, uh, satisfaction that you have helped the family. And yesterday, I was, uh, Friday, I was listening to a, a conversation. It was yesterday, right? Uh, a politician was saying, oh, one of his achievements was that he was able to ensure the recruitment of uh, some of his constituents into the army and the police and all of that. And the, the interviewer says, ah, but that's corruption. He says, oh, but that, how can that be corruption? <laughs> Forgetting that, why, is, it, is, why is he doing that? Because he, he's using his influence peddling. Yeah, but he, he wants to win the next election. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't think that the benefit is coming to him. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he doesn't see any corrupt behavior around that. But he doesn't see that he being retained as an, a member of parliament is personal to him. All right, let me bring, so, let me bring in uh, Ed Eduji. So, Eduji, it looks like we have major challenges on our hands with reference to that. And one would have thought that the opposition would mount the pressure the same way pressure was mounted and saw some members of the previous administration resign. Um, we've not seen that kind of thing in this current setup. Resigning? I, I, I don't yes, <coughs> the bus branding scandal, oh, Jifa yeah, Ativo uh, was forced to resign. Mm -hmm. Jifa? Uh, Charlotte Osei was eventually removed. Mm -hmm. I Jifa, don't want to continue. I think, Jifa, the, the <laughs> question is always about the body language of the leader. The Akufuado presidency appears to have taken, I don't care, whatever you say, for Look, this is a president in his inaugural address indicated that he's going to protect the public purse by insisting on value for money. The principal legal architecture for ensuring, you know, value for money, transparency, among other things, are the provisions of Article 1815 relative to transactions and the Public Procurement Act. What has been the conduct and posturing of this president relative to this enactment? The president got his attorney general to prosecute the NCA matter, correct? As we speak, the president is prosecuting matters on Cocoa Board, correct? Mm -hmm. Maslock, snakes, among other things, on alleged breaches of the Public Procurement Act and causing financial loss to the state. And in some cases, mm -hmm. misappropriation. Which, now, and a lot of them all happen to be NDC appointees. No, all of them NDC appointees. Mm -hmm. In the past four years of the Akufuado presidency, a lot of procurement infractions have happened. And none of them is facing due process or going through criminal prosecution. Look, as we speak, Shratch a body mandated under the 1992 constitution to investigate some of this issue had come out with a 113 page report on ABAJ. And in this report, Shrad found as a fact that ABAJ was able to keep an amount of 40 million Ghana cities in his private account without any explanation as to how he came by those funds. In fact, Schrad found as a fact that his account balance in Stanchart before he became the CEO of the Public Procurement Authority was a certain figure. The same account today has a global sum of 40 million Ghana cities in it. 
what has been the body language of the president? I don't care. Today, as we speak, the president, attorney general, got some people prosecuted, and there are seven prison ten in Isawam over allegations that they breached the Public Procurement Act and causing financial loss to the state. Today, a parliamentary bipartisan committee has found as a fact that the president's minister of health had breached not only the Public Procurement Act, but the 1992 constitution. When he had the benefit in somewhere in Bono region, he made mockery of the whole conversation. So our president speaks in one way, but his body language is facing the other side. We need to situate that conversation within the overall body language of the president. Listen, and I was listening to my, my, my learned senior here, where he made the point that, look, the president any time corruption conversation comes in, it's quick to say that I have resource the agencies tasked to fight corruption, irregularities, among other things. If I look at the 2020 Auditor General's report, table one, the Auditor General had found as a fact that the global sum of irregularities committed as of December 2016 is about 700 million Ghana cities. Now listen, by December, 2020, the amount of irregularities is now 12 billion Ghana cities. And now this president has the temerity to talk about fighting corruption. So we need to have the conviction, even in terms of value, the, the level of irregularity, having resolved this organization, is now 12 billion Ghana cities from 700 million. And you say you are fighting corruption. It is either the president is unaware or the country is on autopilot. Either way. Or it is also possible that public officers are not doing their job. No, have that, you thought you see, about that? But you see, because have, ultimately look, they carry see, that responsibility. Let me, let me, let me give well. you a classic example. So whether public, 30 seconds then yes, then we'll take whether public officers are in fact doing this. Look, <laughs> when the president in the famous uh, Sputnik V conversation, when it came up, the president had an opportunity to say that, I, Akufuado, having gotten my attorney general to prosecute and put people in prison for breaching the Procurement Act, if there's evidence that my minister had breached the Procurement Act, what did the president do? He rather made it a laughing matter now, so if you have a president, you yourself. I don't know, but. if you have a president whose body language suggests that he's not willing, classic example, okay. uh, uh, Dom Levo. I mean, you've given okay. my co panelist okay. some time. I was going to come back yes. to you. But look still. at Dom Levo's scenario, mm -hmm. right? He is the Auditor General. Under very bizarre circumstances, he's been made to go home because we are told he's 60 years, right? Then the president. Who can ask someone to go on retirement because he's 60? Has just appointed a 77 year old man as the executive director of Yoko. Oh, Where, I, I think he I think he's left now. No, I think the I saw... current Mr. Dapa, he was just appointed less than a month. Okay. It was a dupo. Uh, the, okay, a dupo was previous, one is different. Yeah. He okay. just appointed Mr. Dapa, a respected lawyer, 77 years old. As the now executive director of Yoko, where is the principal? Okay, I'll hold you there. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Eduji Tamaklu there. And we're still here with our guests, Dr. Kojo Asanti, Kamal Dean Abdullah, as well as Dr. Yao Graham. We take a quick break and we'll be right back. take them quickly and then we'll speak to Dr. Yao Graham. This one from Benjamin says, fighting corruption under the Akufuado government is a partisan parochial pursuit rather than the real corruption cancer that has bedeviled our economy. Um, his fight has been uh, to act to suit his team. This president has disappointed us. 
This one from Abdul in Agona Nyakrom says, I don't think this current government is ready to fight this canker because everything indicates that government has already lost the fight. If government means business, then the Akufuado administration should start with the prosecution of their own appointees who themselves have engaged in corrupt practices. And a final one from Koshi. The leadership style is the most important element in fighting corruption. If subordinates can sense a radiance of abhorrence for corruption around leadership, they will be quickly whipped in line. No amount of policing can prevent corruption. The most effective antidote to corruption is a construct of a culture against it. Uh, Dr. Graham, I'll come to you and I'll take these as your final points. The Akufuado government has uh, three years left of its mandate because really the year will soon be over. Is there an opportunity to turn things around quickly? I mean, three, three years is a, it's a long time for a government to build you know, a, a, a legacy. Um, so it, it can. But the, the discussion that we are having points to both uh, limitations of his uh, construction of what amounts to uh, corruption, to uh, his, uh, his understanding of the processes of fighting corruption. You see, because, I mean, the thing about resourcing institutions and so on, I mean, that is all very true. But from what has been said uh, by, by people not only on this program but elsewhere, I mean, what a leader does is, 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 is important. Because if you take the view that these things are delegated uh, to certain institutions to do, uh, it's bureaucratic, it's legalistic. And uh, I mean, if you take, to take an example, President Mills had a reputation as a personally clean person, and so on and so forth. I mean, contrary to what our uh, NDC friends like to say, I think that Mills was a very poor national leader. Uh, and even as he had this posture all around him, many things were going wrong. And ultimately, he had to be accountable. Uh, you come back to, uh, to, 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 to President Akufuado. You have a situation where if there is a consensus in a ruling group about, as it were, the, 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 what the benefits and perquisites of power, whether it is to get people from your hometown taken into the military, whether it is to build the roads uh, in your, your village, you know, uh, whether it is to divert uh, business from uh, particular uh, private sector actors, to businesses concerned with you. You know, there are many, many things that become a perception of what is okay to do. Uh, because there's a point made about, for example, public servants not doing their work. The morale of the public service has been broken by years of political bullying and also uh, basically victimization and illegal acts which have kept, you know, people afraid to do things. I mean, I've heard stories where people have tried to recruit and uh, processes are finished and they get a call from somebody higher up, said, add these people, you know, uh, to the list. So, so, and they are not qualified. They didn't go through the process. So all these things are tolerated uh, on a day-to-day -day basis away from maybe the high profile uh, procurement thing, which in a way confirm for the public that actually what we perceive in our day-to-day -day lives where I apply for a job and I discover that actually the process closed off even whilst I was applying because some people came through a side door. People add all these things up and feel that regimes, I mean, the government says one thing, the president pronounced one thing, but the day-to-day -day functioning of how power is used is completely contrary. So. It is what is lived and, 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 and done which would define the legacy. And as it is now, clearly, I mean, I agree with a number of things that Kuyo has said because, I mean, he and others have been looking, you know, a, a lot more closely at, at, at the granular dimensions of the, of the corruption problem. So, yes, the president has a chance, 
to fix a legacy. But we are not talking about the president as a person. The president is the head of a collection of people in power. Is that collection of people ready suddenly to radically change course? Where uh, instead of uh, government being a business opportunity, mm. government becomes an opportunity to let the Ghanaian people feel that actually elections give us accountable government, not elections give us people who see an opportunity for themselves and their associates. That, I think, is the, is the, 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 the incline that the president you know, has to get to the top of and to be able to build a legacy. And it's, it's a very steep incline. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yao Graham. He is the coordinator for a third. Um, I was given an amended. Let me just go to that. I was given an the amended. Third World Network, Network. Africa. Network. <laughs> yes. So Third World Network Africa. Yes, because I was I didn't put the Africa the first time. But thank you very much, Dr. Yao Graham, uh, for joining us. Always a pleasure to speak to you and uh, tap into your knowledge. Much appreciated, sir. And let me come back to the studio, to uh, our guests in the studio. So I'll come back to you, um, Kamal Dean, quickly. So Dr. Graham has pointed out what could be a, a legacy. But there's also the issue of what Edrigi raised about the procurement malfeasance that is very evident in the Auditor General's report. We need to bring this to an end some way, somehow. Yeah. Um, um, first of all, the past or immediate past Auditor General's name came up in our discussion, um, which had to, you even asked the first question as to, or not a question, but you mentioned how he was um, taken out of office. Domelevo, I referred to here. The question I ask, and that comes to mind, is simple. We're here talking about laws and talking about how we breach laws or some have breached some laws allegedly and they are not being prosecuted. Others, you claim, same laws have actually been reneged upon, but been punished in a way. Don't believe all matter. If we all know clearly... You that, have to speed up no, on that. I'm so speeding up. Sorry. If we all know that this was wrong, or some wrong has been commissioned by people in authority, which led to Don't believe being out, what stop us from testing the laws? What stop us? But we are testing it in court. Uh, very good. That, you know it's at the so, Supreme so, right now. Yeah, I know. I know. Okay. So right. what stop us? Nothing stopped us. Mm -hmm. So having been to court and then pursuing the matter, okay, it's yeah, not been to its logical conclusion. But, but we do not say, we cannot say that someone has wrongly or wrongfully taken some uh, uh, domino out. The point is that the argument is there to make the court is yet to make a pronouncement on the matter. Let's move. Okay, on. but now, why two, do you then appoint two, a seventy-seven-year-old person? So, two, as Eduji had pointed out, Dr. Then. Graham made a very critical point. <laughs> he used the word perception. He says all these discussions we are having hinges on perception, which is a very strong word in the corruption palace. That we all know that yes. When you come out to say there's some corruption out there, you perceive to say there's corruption. Okay? Then, of course, you have to prove it and back same with the evidence that it demands for measures to be taken, as it were. My good brother, Edugi says, is about leadership. And it stops with the president. But examples have they, been given. They, they, Those, they, are stops, listen, oh, Those are not perception, Mr. Abdullahi. Those are not perception. Well, I beg your pardon, sir. Corruption, discussion of corruption, trust me. Yeah, but, but I'm saying that the examples and given are not perception. They are real. They've happened. That's We've seen it. We've experienced it. <laughs> he says leadership is a problem. And that the president of the republic has not shown leadership. Maybe yesterday, John Dramani Mahama showed leadership. Clearly. Let's focus it brings on me, the current administration. We will focus on John Dramani Mahama. No, Equally, sir. He focus. No, we will focus on John He's not in office what? anymore. You've forgotten of... Uh, yes, right. Eduji. You see, I like, I like the discussion of um, Doc. When Doc says, look, nepotism is part of corruption. Mm -hmm. You may not have gained directly, but maybe a third party gained. Essentially, there was a gain. Point I want to make. The Daniel Batendam late by Daniel Batendam. May he rest in peace and the Ford gift or Ford bribe saga. You remember that? I remember you were the one interviewing him or someone else on Jordan. Okay? 
just when you mentioned that a Ford has been gifted or had actually been given to the president and by someone who has actually secured a contract under the same government, the line dropped. You and I know how that The went. line dropped. You and I saw leadership, how that leadership. You and I leadership. saw how that ended. The NDC lost that election eventually. So the point I'm just trying to make is that these things that we talk about, they are real. Mm -hmm. They are not perce perception is where you, you think that is happening. Maybe you've not directly experienced it, but these things have, have happened. Um, um, or Dr. So Asante, that, am so I that, So that when you make a logical argument that the Auditor General's report yesterday came up with some infractions that, of course, in summation, will get some 500, 700 million Ghana cities lost to Ghana. And today, the Auditor General report comes out to say that some 13 billion is lost. Then the conclusion is that there is much more corruption now based on the work that we have done. I could ask a simple question. Could it also be that yesterday, the scrutiny and the due diligence that we needed most from the auditors of such same report Funny. was lacking? Can I also make that argument, logically? So you see, the point is that whether it's even one city that is actually misappropriated and not put right, Ghana stands to lose. Let's all fight it. Okay. Dr. Asante, yeah. is uh, there any hope for us? Because oh, the, the, if there is 11 billion... <laughs> Uh, uh, corruption, I, I beg your pardon, procurement malfeasance. I'm not exactly sure where the hope well, is. Well, for me, <laughs> we don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And I think we're also running out of time. Yeah. You see, pe people do not count. I've been, I've been in civil society for 16 years. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't see the gradual erosion of trust in the state, trust in leadership, as these things, you know, I mean, sometimes when we even do surveys and you see the levels of 88 percent, 90 percent perceiving. But, but, but interestingly, the Afrobarometer surveys, when it comes to the trust yeah. data, yeah. the president and the military, yeah. they are usually on top. But even that you see dips, you understand. But you see, if, if the whole, and, and Dr. Graham made that point, that people experience corruption at, at many, many different levels. Mm. The society we are fighting for, what Kamal, his, the, his uh, children, you know, the Jewish children and who want to live in that society, has to be one of merit. If it comes that you have to know somebody for you to have access to good education or to have Bad. access to uh, um, health, Jobs. That you get there, so, somebody jobs. has to extort money from you, jobs. even when people you are... People join political even, parties yes, because they exactly. feel they will get jobs you know, when, there. When you get the, to the that test, point... Is it Tescon? They are the ones who filed a petition at the presidency because like of lack of jobs. Yeah, like but you see... Uh, but you see well, well, as the kind of story... But that is that kind of... That kind of side. But I just wanted to make some quick points. Because I know you're in a... And we'll take a final point from Mr. Tamaku. Sure. So, how do we move forward? You know, the issue about ethics for me is important. Mm -hmm. And the code of conduct for public office holders, which comes to parliament and disappears, comes to parliament. We have to, we have to, return because, like it, because, the, oh yeah, yeah, I, it, it has been, it has been over a decade. Every time it comes to parliament, parliament, you know, run out and then we have to start all over again. If we can codify it, it helps. So that people know that this is also against the law. And that will help. The issue around, uh, for me, the public financial management. You see, when the Auditor General's report comes, and the public financial management gives the finance minister a lot of powers. You don't hear any directives, any signals that say, we have seen this type of you know, cash irregularities, and therefore, these are the instructions going to MMDCs and MDAs and so on, that from now, this and this measures we are taking. We have written to the Ministry of Finance about this matter that there is no office there that does enforcement of financial uh, uh, rules. And they need an office that purposely set up to deal with that. Because if we don't do that, it just sends bad signals around that you can get away with it. All right. And that creates a, a real problem for us. All right. Edu your final point. You see, I think that this whole thing, again, like I indicated, we need to focus on the body language again of the president. Because ultimately, the decision to fire or not to fire rests with him. The decision to prosecute or not to prosecute rests with him. Now, when you have a situation where the president deliberately weaponizes prosecution against his political opponent, then the claim that he 
wants to fight corruption is not one born out of sincerity, purely for partisan political gain. Now, if you have a situation where you are currently prosecuting people for alleged breaches of the Procurement Act, and you have appointees of the president who have breached the act in the same manner and those who have done. You keep on no, 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 no. It's important that, that the, because, the because of the president, yes. because the president himself has said he was going to protect the public purse. Now, if the narrative today looks like the purse had been taken away, the people will now know that it was just mere sloganeering, rhetoric. President Akufuado has no desire whatsoever to fight the canker of corruption. And that's the scorecard. All right. You, you are lucky. You have 30 <laughs> seconds. I have 30 seconds. Yes. When you say that the scorecard. Yes. The, yes. You, you, you summed it up by saying that yesterday, if you did things wrong, they were voted against. Yes. Of course. So today, we need to face it head on, whatever that comes. Um, I, I will remain on my position to say that, look, you cannot do anything without records in the law. Let's ensure that it moves on. He says he's talking about procurement breaches and all that. I agree with him perfectly. And of course, even Admaminu himself did not say that, look, we did not breach procurement laws. He himself admitted it. So that. why is he not being prosecuted? So, 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 so the reason so so doesn't matter. So the honorable, so you do the honorable thing. leave office. Why did you fire? The Jifa, president Jifa, 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 Jifa backdated Jifa, Jifa, Jifa. Uh, uh, the bus branding contract. She eventually left office. Listen, Charlotte Osei was Jifa. taken on. She Isn't was executed. Are quite different. No, it's, no, it's the Jifa. same breaches of the procurement. So, I'm not saying not. there's no breach of the law. There is. No, Clearly. look, Clearly. an Clearly. independent, let's know, uh, an independent what? constitutional body Jifa. like EC, each chairperson that has security of ten can be removed. It, on the sole basis of breaches made, of the procurement you have made as a by President Akufuado. It does not lie in your mouth, you, in the you, face of you evidence, have made as a lawyer to continue. Arguments severally it is not a question of morality. Have, okay, so, gen so, gentlemen, morality. so gentlemen, I'll bring that to your question. So, so when did you remove Salato Sey? Thank you very much, gentlemen. And the program is the key point. And thank you very much for joining us on today's edition. My guests have been Dr. Yao Graham of the Third World Network Africa. Also, Dr. Kojo Asante, a Director for Policy Advocacy at CDD Ghana. Also, Edu Jitamaklo, NDC legal team member. And Kamal Dean Abdullah, NPP Deputy Communications Director. I want to say thanks to all of you for sticking with us over the last three hours. My name is Jifa Bampo. Up next is Warm Up Plus. Have a wonderful weekend. Join us again next Saturday.